and welcome to the 24th Annual Capital Conference Virtual Edition. It is our goal that each session is about an hour in length. Some may be shorter and some may be longer. Uh, my name is David Stevens. I'm the Director of Academic Activities for UIL. Also helping with this session is Glenda Mignot, Administrative Assistant for UIL Academics, who you uh, often hear from on email only, but now you might get to see her face. So this session is Poetry Explication. Uh, it's our literary criticism contest. Our presenter is Mr. Mark Bernier, who is probably one of the best supporters of UIL activity. And uh, he hosts multiple events. He uh, obviously runs this contest and uh, is one of the uh, biggest advocates for what we do in UL academics and uh, one of the best cheerleaders that I think any of your students could ever want. So it's happy, we're very happy to have you. Thanks for doing this, Mark. I know this virtual format certainly isn't your favorite way to be doing things, but we do appreciate you being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge with our attendees in this new format. So take it away. Well, thank you, David, for the introduction, and you gave me a bit of a segue to one of our terms, understatement. Yes, it is. Not one of my favorite by a long shot. I uh, need to say, since you introduced me as someone who works with uh, UIL at all levels, I see on the screen Jessica, and I know Maddie's out there and a few others, no doubt. I don't have access to everybody, but that's part, and um, Gail's out there, but uh, Maddie and Jessica, they helped me at all levels, district all through the state. And Jessica, thanks for proofreading. I wish you had looked at my list. I have connation instead of connotation, but there we go. Uh, we usually get this done in about an hour and a half, and that's never enough time. So a little bit different than usual without the face-to-face. -face. I'm just gonna run through these poems, and certainly you know very well that it's not gonna be performance level, and I don't know where I'm going to stop in the middle of a poem. That is to make sure that we've addressed any a number of terms that might be uh, subject to my uh, putting them in a multiple choice question in part two, part three, and to some extent, uh, this kind of understanding of the poem and its um, aspects of uh, you know these techniques, these literary terms. So also, also part four. So not much a tip of a hat here to William Wordsworth because he's our poet this year, but because this poem, and most of you have seen it before, it really offers uh, me a chance to point out any number of things that I might ask about. So there's a lot of repetition over the years. I pulled these points from the past few capital conferences, well, the past many capital conferences, but they are for, uh, I keep in mind that my audience probably is um, half newbies, that they, they who are new to this, and I make the apology once again that I address or must, because this is the nature of the contest, these poems in terms of multiple choice questions. So we begin, and every now and then you'll hear a grandchild or a, I guess, a grand dog in the background. I'm not going to apologize. I, I get the sense that's the nature of Zoom. William Wordsworth's London 1802. Everybody at that point? So on that list that David made reference to, the uh, listing of terms, I don't know how easy it is for each of you to access. I'm not asking you to do so, but if I throw a term out there with which you have no familiarity, there is the spelling. If you want me to uh, say a little bit more about the term, uh, I will gladly do that. Some of the terms are listed in groups. That is, uh, for instance, we can look at inversion and see hyperpathon or anastrophe. And those, those terms are similar enough in the handbook that I will never have your liter, literary critic kids, your lit critters, have to choose from among those closely related terms. But you should know all three, I might, because the terms are different even in the handbook, uh, but not distinctly so. I will uh, sometimes go look for the specific term, but the other two will not be there as distractors. London, 1802. Milton, immediately we know this is an apostrophe. An apostrophe is addressing someone who does not, cannot, will not respond. Thou shouldest be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. She is a fen of stagnant waters, altar, sword, and pen, fireside, the heroic wealth of hall and bower, have forfeited their ancient English dower of inward 
happiness. Again, this is uh, far from uh, performance. What we know here real quick is that we have two types of rhyme going on. Line one, line four, line five, and that line eight we haven't gotten to yet. Our, Bauer, Power, I miss Dower. These are feminine endings, and in the construct of this sonnet, they are feminine rhymes. The last syllable is unaccented in contrast to, for instance, lines two and three ending with a stressed or an accented syllable. That's a masculine rhyme in the, in the, in the uh, continuance of those two lines by itself. It's a masculine ending. Uh, to point out a difference, this is a sonnet. Most sonnets are uh, following the, the traditional iambic pentameter, which means 10 syllables per line. You might note that line one and line four and line five and line eight, for example, have 11 syllables. The last one being unaccented, a lot of that stems back to that 1066 invasion where a lot of French came in and we lost a lot of the German in the, in the, in the expression of, of the common things in our, in our world. Um, she is a fin of stagnant waters. That's a metaphor. It doesn't read she is like. If you want to personify by virtue of the gender that's pushing it a little bit, I will not ask whether or not England has been personified by giving it a she. Uh, that is a tradition that uh, is found in more languages than just English, but more so in more other languages. She is a fan of stagnant waters, metaphor, altar, sword, and pen, fireside, the heroic wealth of Hall and Bower. These are metatomic terms. Altar is not the church or religion. It is closely associated with. The sword is not the army, the military, in this case, probably the Navy. England is an island, as we'll point out later. It is closely associated. Pen is not part of an author, but a closely associated with author, authorship. Fireside, the heroic wealth of Hall and Bauer, all of that is, especially Fireside, metatomic representation of that which, in this case, Wordsworth is pointing out England is very proud. Metonymy is a sister trope to synecdity. It too is on your list, and they are hard to separate. I will not ask your lit critters to differentiate between metonymy and synecdity. Metonymy is a term, a word used to represent something that it is closely associated with. Both Trump and Biden, Biden are running for the White House. No, they're running for president. Not officially on Biden's part yet, but uh, that's what they're running for, the presidency. But we say the White House, the Oval Office, that, that, that sort of thing that the scepter is for a king representative of power. It is not actually part of it unless the king wants to hit somebody over the head. I guess you got something going there. And synecdoche is, a sister trope, is when a word is used to represent the whole or part of a thing. All hands on deck is the classic example that's either very gruesome or we understand that it's synecdoche or uh, where'd you park your wheels? You know, you're asking where is the car or ha where have you parked your car? So in this case, lines three and four, we have wonderful example of metonymy, altar, sword, pin, fireside. The heroic wealth of Hall and Bower have forfeited their ancient English dower of inward happiness. Dower is a license, a poetic license, a shortening of dowry. We are selfish men. Oh, raise us up again. Excuse me, raise us up, return to us again. Once again, heading back to the first word of the poem, Milton, this is an apostrophe. The speaker or the persona in the poem is speaking to something from which he does not expect an answer, Milton having died some two centuries or, uh, before. Uh, differences now, listing on that last slide, uh, persona and speaker. Uh, a persona is a adapted, we, we, we go into the Italian and find persona meaning mask, um, is an adapted or an adopted both, uh, a mask that a poet might put on, and the narrator, we, well, we kind of hang that with, uh, with, the, with the prose stuff, and the speaker in the poem is someone who's doing the speaking without putting on a mask. Here we have Milton. Here we have Milton speak, excuse me, Wordsworth speaking to Milton. Excuse me for a minute. Hey guys. 
Thank you. We have words are speaking to Milton. He, uh, uh, like T.S. Eliot, doesn't put on a mask. It's always Wordsworth talking. So we, the speaker says, are selfish men here in the 19th century. Raise us up, return to us again, and give us manners, virtue, freedom, power. We have a sequence of terms, manners, virtue, freedom, power, without a conjunction that is um, a sydnaton. Its contrast is polysydnaton. So when you do not have an and or a but or an or or a nor, listing a, to accommodate the rhyme and the rhythm here, the meter and give us manners, virtue, freedom, pow, love it, syllable, er. Uh, without that and, we have an occasion of a sentence. If we put in manner and virtue and freedom, and we've put in too many conjunctions, as it were, to accommodate the meter, that's polysyndeton. We've gone through eight lines. This is, though it's written by a Britisher, this is as close as we can get to a Petrarchan or an Italian sonnet. Um, we might even argue that it's a Miltonic sonnet. A Miltonic sonnet is a sonnet in the tradition of the Italian, the Petrarchan, but it does not have a turn. There is no turn here. We call that turn a volta. A volta is a turn usually occurring at the ninth line, but not always. It could occur in the 13th line. And for the most part, the turn, the volta, V-O-L-T-A, is either logical or temporal in nature. It could be something that in kind of a storyline, there's a shift in setting, but the, that fits in with time also, temporal. This is by way of an explanation. Now we're going to look at the sestet, the last six lines, and we're going to notice that there is a C and a free together. That eliminates it from being a Italian sonnet perfectly. The Italian sonnet does not like any kind of couplet rhyming. So this comes closest to a Petrarchan, or otherwise known as an Italian sonnet. It has a octave, first eight lines, a sestet, the next six lines, and thus we have two stanzas, an octave and a sestet. If we were looking at an English sonnet, a Spenserian sonnet, or a Shakespearean sonnet, the Shakespearean and the English being the same, we would have a quatrain, quatrain, quatrain couplet, all adding up to 14, and that would be Four stanzas. All right, the sestet. Thy soul was like a star. Now, the star is capitalized. Uh, English uh, has uh, changed its uh, traditions. Remember, it's a German language. Uh, language It's a German language, and the Germans still capitalize half their nouns, if not more. So that, that is an emphasis there. Don't overemphasize it, but it reminds us it's an important sort of this, this, this notion of his soul, Milton's, like a star by virtue of the, of the simile, something we need to look at and immediately, not necessarily the North Star, but a guiding star reminding ourselves that the English are a maritime nature, nation. And uh, so a guiding star is what is inferred there and dwelt apart. Now, had us the voice whose sound was like the sea. Here's a term I'm gonna throw at you that's not in the handbook any longer. We are losing, we're losing, we have lost a good handbook, the 11th. We're working out of the 12th edition. The 12th edition has lost a number of too many good terms. We don't have time to go into my guessing why. And so it's an older edition, the 12th edition. If you're buying something, buy the 11th. It's a much better edition. But I am restricted to my terms, except for two or three. One of them is I'm restricted by my using the 11th edition to the terms in the 11th edition, excuse me, excuse me, 12th edition, thank you, Jessica, 12th edition, but I add a couple. One is sigmatism, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-S-M, -S -S sigmatism, not stigmatism, but sigmatism, and that's the repetition of sibilant sounds, not simply at the beginning of a word, beginning of a syllable, but also in the middle of a syllable, excuse me, the middle of a word, or the ending syllable. Thou haddest a voice 
whose sound was like the sea. We have the S's going all the way through, the sibilant S's all the way through. That's an occasion of sigmatism. Pure as the naked heavens, another simile. Majestic, free, again, without the conjunction, the sydnaton, A-S-Y-N. So didst thou travel on life's common way. This is one of these, I would argue, but I would never ask the student to recognize it as a dead metaphor. Life is a journey sort of thing. It has come into our understanding of our lives as a journey that, but it is metaphor. One might say it's a dead metaphor. It's lost its vehicle and tenor as separate to draw attention to it. It's become part of the idiom. In cheerful godliness, here's where, and Wordsworth is our poet this year, and we are not going to have this on a test. Here it is already being explicated as, as I do these presentations. This is not really explication, it's just it's tearing it apart so I can do multiple choice questions. We should know that cheerful has everything to do with charity. We look into, for instance, the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's the sort of thing you should be responsible for, or your students should be responsible for, that is knowing the vocabulary that Wordsworth would have used in the early 19th century. These words do change meaning. And cheerful is not happy, except we are happy when we are charitable. And we consider God charitable, and the godliness and the cheerfulness fits together if we understand that cheerful has not only a connotation at the beginning of the 19th century, but is the denotation of charity. In charitable good godliness, and yet thy heart, the lowliest duties on herself did lay. Rhyme scheme, A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A. Another term that's not in the 12th edition of the handbook is envelope stanza, where you have the rhyming of the first and the fourth line in a quatrain enveloping whatever occurs in the middle, whether those BB or BC, the hour and the bower, the dower and the power or envelope, uh, demark envelope stanzas. Uh, the last, uh, so we've got an AD, and so we have C, D, D, E, C, E as a rhyme scheme. I take questions here, David. I'm not seeing any in the question box so far. Okay. Moving to David Herbert Lawrence's piano. This one's dear to me for a couple, three reasons, not necessarily the um, content, but the performance one year up at Tyler. Uh, piano, simple title. You might remind your students, your lit critters, that titles mean quite a bit. Sometimes the titles are incorporated into the poem itself. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. Were this a poem that uh, I would put in part four the question we have to do with imagery. Uh, whether it's auditory imagery, necessarily we see the, uh, the anima apia at work with boom and tingling. Uh, we, we have tactile imagery with the pressing. We have visual imagery that, that's verging in on both because it's a piano, auditory, and um, and, and tactile, the poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. The melopoeic, which is a term on your list, I believe Elliot gave us that, it might have been pound, Ezra Pound, yeah, melopoeic, a term for all the alliteration, the assonance, the consonance, the onomatopoeia, all those sound devices that we are enjoying in this particular poem. The tingling strings, ting and string, we have some rhyme going on there. We also have strings and sing. So rhyme throughout, which promotes the sound aspect of the subject matter at hand. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song, and we introduced by way of denotation, insidious, uh, something not so delightful here. Um, that dusk 
that starts at the beginning, maybe it's getting dark by use of this word. In spite of myself, maybe there's an argument going on here. He's not wishing to. The insidious mastery of song betrays me back. Again, the, the use of the term, the denotation here. Um, we've shifted tone. Till, till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano, our guide. While we have rhyme throughout, we are not picking up a constant meter. There is, there is a, uh, a, a, a quality to this poem that while it emulates by virtue of rhyme, something we might consider song, there's an iffiness. And now that's not a literary term, but there's, there's something going on with the lack of constant metrical patterning. To the old Sunday evenings at home with winter, things are, things are easing up a little in terms of the tone and the hymns easing up, cozy, really easing up, the tinkling piano, our guide. So now we've, we, we, we've moved, there's a temporal shift in the third stanza here. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor. Not only we temporal, but also place. We, we were first line, in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, perhaps this is a piano bar. Then we are in the back, uh, back in time, listening to the mother, his mother. And now in the third, this temporal and the locus is shifting. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano uh, appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. Not much to say in terms of the technique. We have rhyme, we have quatrains, we have connotation, we have denotation, but when we get to a discussion of the poem, we can focus on tone, we can focus on imagery. I do not want to, uh, though I'll draw your attention to the possibility line 10, the great black piano appassionato. The piano is not appassionato, the playing of the piano, the fullness of the tone, the, 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 the conflation of the memory and the moment at hand. And so this might be considered a transferred epithet where we are describing the piano in terms of how it's being played or the mood of the man playing it, excuse me, the woman playing it, and not the piano itself. The piano uh, is kind of sitting there. David, questions? Not yet. You're doing great, I guess. Well, well you keep guessing. I'll keep hoping. Third poem on our, on our move through this stuff, Rudyard Kipling's The Explanation. Love and death once ceased their strife at the tavern of man's life. We open up with the personification of love and the personification of death. The title has us thinking, I hope. Love and death are not the usual pairings in a dichotomy. It's love and hate or life and death. Something's going on here. And maybe here we are with a metaphor, the tavern of man's life. Late 19th century, Kipling having spent his life, I guess, either in the army or in England, which doesn't discount our recognizing that man's life can be as raw and uh, inducing and or anyway, at the tavern of man's life, called for wine and threw, alas, each his quiver on the grass. It seems as maybe we have come to some kind of peace, some kind of agreement. And just by way of remember, not to insult anybody, but we don't do this all that often. The quiver holding all those arrows. And there is embedded here an allusion, an allusion, I think, to, let's say, Cupid. You got quiver and you got love. And more, not, in, not necessarily in the terms of opposite, death by way of arrow, that's still in recent memory. So each quiver on the grass, one held arrows of love, one held arrows of death. When the bout was over, they found, and we've come across over instead of, uh, or instead of over, 
this elision and on, on your um, handout, you'll have, I think I put in an extra term, yeah, sim cookie. Um, and, and the handbook does not make a clear differential for us that I can say it's either a lesion or a syncope. Uh, so I will never have one as an answer and the other as a distractor. But we've dropped a syllable to accommodate the meter of the line. When the bout was over, they found mingled arrows strewed the ground. Hastily they gathered them, excuse me, hastily they gathered then each the loves and lives of men. They gathered then. This is inversion. We've taken the words out of order to accommodate the rhyme. We probably would say hastily they then gathered, but that would not accommodate the rhyme and it would do a little injustice to the rhythm. Hastily they gathered then each the loves and lives of men. Now we have not a chiasmus, but we're having to make a kind of metaphorical jump through our associations from love to love, easily enough, line one, and death and lives, line one and eight. So there's a, there's a, there's a connection there. Gathered then each the loves and lives of men. And this, I think, is an illusion um, closely, and not, not directly, but closely associated with what we'll come across in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where we have the representation of, of fate from the Greek mythology, the three women doing all that with the wool outside the doctor's office. And here, each quiver has the fate of each individual, whether he's going to love or die, love or live, and now they're all strewn on the grass outside the tavern. And so what had been planned in the way of fate, something's going to intervene and it's drunken personified love and death. Each the loves and lives of men, line nine, ah, the fateful dawn deceived, mingled arrows each one sheathed, death's dread armory was stored with the shafts he most ado uh, abhorred. So there's a, so death ends up with uh, loves, responsibilities and love ends up with death's responsibilities. Love's light quiver groaned beneath venom-headed darts of death. Thus it was they wrought our woe. The alliteration is thick here at the tavern long ago. Tell me, do our masters know, loosing blindly as they fly, old men love while young men die? Uh, not unlike what we'll pick up pretty soon, historically, chronologically, with Sassoon and, and um, Owen and others, this, this uh, recognition that men are sent off to war as children. And here, this blindly, our masters, do they know that uh, while old men love, young men die, it should be the other way around. And so we have a paradox in the form of a rhetorical question. Pretty straightforward rhyme scheme, A, A, B, B, C, C. I don't need to keep going. All of it is masculine rhyme. And that's all I have to say about Kipling's. We could use it in part four in terms of tone, kind of a growing, uh, shifting from what is uh, established by there being a conflict between love and death and then uh, something immediately lying to evidence of reconciliation. And the thing is, uh, the reconciliation, there's this wonderful Greek mythology, uh, myth that uh, I think it is Browning takes a hold of with Athonis, where he asks for eternal life and forgets to ask for eternal youth at the same time. Uh, the gods don't care about us. Love and death as abstractions uh, don't care. And here we are suffering because our masters can't recognize that we're at the, uh, that, that we, we are trinkets in the, in the world that is governed by fate, but fate has been turned upside down and our masters who send the soldiers forward don't recognize this. Questions, David? Looking at line nine, would that be replication or personification? Um, if we were going to talk about reification, I think we'd have to go back up to the top and love and death as abstractions once cease their strife. And I don't know that 
I would ask the students to recognize reification instead of personification. They're awfully close. And I would stay with personification because love and death traditionally have been personified more so than ideas like ambition that we have uh, Thomas Gray and Elegy in a Country Churchyard where ambition mocks. Ambition is not something we personify often and, and ambition doesn't uh, seem to permeate our stories, whether they're mythological or uh, uh, colloquially uh, traditional. So there could be an argument made, but I would not ask the students, the lit critters, to see reification in this point. That's all we have so far. Sharon Olds, Chamber Thicket. Oh, we need to move along if I'm going to catch any of these. Chamber Thicket. Um, Sharon Olds, I hope you all know Sharon Olds. I've used this poem some years back. Uh, what she does here is uh, conflate, if you will, even in the title, the notion of chamber music, which is played by instruments made of wood, and a thicket, which is uh, a reference to the woods out of which uh, someone she will be speaking about on line 20. So there's a conflation there that she continues, can carries all the way through. As we sat at the feet of the string quartet in their living room on a winter night, through the hard word, excuse me, through the hardwood floor spurts and gulps, the tips and shutters came up. So the spurts and gulps and tips and shutters, what we have there, uh, not exclusively music sounds, but sounds that as they are modified by the wood floor, this onomatopoeia is speaking to the music being produced. And the candle scent air was thick alive with pearwood, ebony, spruce, poplar, and, and, and what we have there is the traditional woods that make instruments, whether we're talking oboes or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bagpipes or the, help me out here, the violins and the violas, all that sort of stuff. Horse howled and scat, excuse me there, I missed that one, Freudian and maybe, and horse howled and cat squealed. The horse is truncated recognition of horse hair that is used on violin bows. And cat squeal, that truncated notion of cat gut being used for the actual strings of stringed instruments. And so once again, onomatopoeia, the auditory imagery, the melopoeia has taken on uh, ascendancy here, even as we start out with the visual, we sat in the living room and we had that hard wood floor. Now we're hearing sounds. And then when the great fugue, the Grossa fugue was around us, under us, over us, in us, I felt I was hearing the genes of my birth family pulled, keening and grieving and seething, uh, excuse me, scathing. Uh, what we have here is polypneton, an overuse of the conjunction and. And I feel myself, excuse me, along each other. So the genes of my birth family being pulled. So there, there's a sense of familial, uh, not at war, but things aren't as consonant. Maybe there's a dissonance already set up by speaking about the horse hair bow howling and the cat gut strings squealing. I felt myself held in the woods of hating, longing, and I knew and knew myself and my parents and their parents there. And then at a distance, I sensed as it were 30 years ago, a being far off yet oblique approaching, straying toward, then not toward, and then toward this place like a wandering, dreaming herdsman, my husband. What I know of the few that music genre has just been described in the oblique going straying toward not toward there's a repetition that the few the great few that's that's we start feeling that the grossa few is a metaphor for life contentiousness in life that is from the macrocosm of life represented by all these instruments coming together as different as individuals are in a family 
they are all using the same sort of natural, call it genes, natural uh, um, organic sort of uh, material, the, the wood and the cat gut and the horse hairs. And so at a microcosmic level, she feels the immediacy of the relationship between herself and her husband. As if it were 30 years ago, line 716, a being far off yet, oblique approaching, straying toward, then not toward, and then toward the, this place, like a wandering, dreaming herdsman, my husband. And I almost wanted to warn him away, to call him out, to call out to him, to go back whence he came into some calmer life, suggesting that the family into which he is going to be invited by way of marriage might not be calm, but his beauty was too moving to me. And I wanted too much to not be alone in the cupboard anymore. And so I prayed him, the cupboard being the thicket, maybe it's that imagery of the family and all the noise, whether it's squealing or howling. And so I prayed him, come to me. I bid him hasten and good welcome. And maybe that's not unlike by way of musical um, analogy. You, you get the sense that while... Um, you listen to Dixieland or jazz, the instruments ask another instrument to come in and maybe change the tone. I, I'm going to do a rhetorical thing here and ask you to remember Sonny's Blues, James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues, where, uh, where, uh, where the brother, the unnamed brother, the narrator is invited into, into Creole's world, into Sonny's world, and he has to learn that the chamber is thick with that he already knew, but he didn't want to communicate. Here, Sharon's old speaker, maybe persona, but I think speaker is asking her husband or maybe suggesting to the husband or asking forgiveness, I brought you into this. I loved you enough. I wanted you there in spite of the danger, in spite of the ongoing um, strife. Questions, please. None so far. Okay, so that, that's what I want to look for a poem. And these poems are never going to show up on a test. Some of them are a little bit difficult. Um, and I can't ask the questions uh, with enough distractors. So they end up in a, dare I say, a bin of poems from which I choose in order to do something like I'm doing today. Uh, to, to give you an idea of what I look at and what I look for. And if I find something wonderful, but I can't find two, three, four distractors for a multiple choice question, it might end up as a tie-breaking focus, or it might not end up in a test at all. But that's how I look at a poem to see whether or not something's going on. And then primarily, though secondarily in terms of how I'm doing this, but primarily I'm looking for questions three to four per poem that I can ask the students because they, I can find legitimate four distractors. Robert Frost, The Oven Bird. I've only seen one. It hit a window in downtown Brenham and recognized it immediately. Not from the poem, but it is a remarkable bird, a little warbler. There is a singer everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and midwood bird, who makes the solid tree trunk sound again. Here we have Robert Frost who rescued some of these classic traditions, these closed form poetry traditions, here a sonnet, when everybody is the Elliots of the world and the Pounds of the world and everybody else moving along. Uh, and he doesn't do it traditionally and it shows up here in the first three lines. It's not a quatrain, it's three lines of a sonnet. And he puts a period there. He says that leaves are old, and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says that early petal fall is past when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. What's happening line to line is run on. Even past what little rhyme might show up, and here there is none to speak of. It is not enjambment. Enjambment is moving from one stanza to the next stanza in terms of grammar and syntax. Sorry, 
Did I say that right? Yeah, grammar and syntax. Uh, the meaning of the sentence, as well as the sentence being a sentence within the poem. This is not. This is simply going from one line to the next line. That's the way we handle run on and enjambment out coming out of the handbook. If you go online and some anthologies, uh, they equate enjambment and run on. We'll have enjambment a little bit later on in this sequence of poems. But this reading from one line to the next, lines six through eight, that's not run on. He says the early petal fall. Now, if this were early Germanic or old English poetry, this petal fall I would call a kinning. Be aware of kinnings. This is not a kinning, which is not true. This is a kinning, but we don't call it a kinning because we're not finding it in Old English, Anglo-Saxon, or Germanic poetry. It's this compound kind of descriptor. He says that early petal fall is past when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. And comes that other fall, we name the fall. That's how every day we are. We can't even come up with a great name. Uh, bird sees something quite different. We just call it, well, the leaves have, fall, have fallen. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. Um, as with all frost poems, there's one heck of a lot going on here. None of which, very little of which I could ask, were this a poem just kind of sitting there? I've used it before, and the very, very simplest, simplistic questions. Were Robert Frost one of our authors of the season? Uh, we would have to pick up on a number of things. One, we would notice that the last line, you might call it the topics line, the topic sentence, the question that he frames in all but words, he's a singing bird, is what to make of a diminished thing. Uh, I could at some point ask one of my students to compare this to A.E. Houseman's um, When I Was One and Twenty. Is that the one I want? No, I'm talking about the cherry boughs. Which one is that? Anyway, uh, rhetorical question apparently, um, where we, we say we do not have enough time in life to enjoy the springs uh, with the cherry blossoms. So I go walking and riding in the winter because the cherry blossoms on the tree limbs look like snow on the tree limbs, so I see them twice as much. Uh, we tend to ignore the fall, the latter part of summer, the bird knows what to make of a diminished thing. There's an argument that Frost is being very autobiographical here as a poet doing things that other poets haven't done. That is, he's making something out of diminished thing. But we do have, in contrast to what I said a while ago, uh, the rhyme. And it's, it's not a, a rhyme scheme that adheres to the tradition that we usually find in a sonnet, and it jumps all over the place. Again, lines four and seven, rather than four and eight, for instance, we have a feminine rhyme, flowers and showers. I'm looking at the clock, so I move on. Wait for a question, David. No question. Okay, Wendy Cope. Wonderful, wonderful poet. Uh, not a lot of stuff I can use in the public setting, but here's one of her poems. Some rules. Stop if the car is going clunk or if the sun has made you blind. Don't answer emails when you're drunk. You fire off something fierce. You're sunk. It's a retrievable. It's signed. You feel your spirits going clunk. Don't hide your face with too much gunk, especially if it's old and lying. Don't answer emails when you're drunk. Don't live with 30 years of junk, those precious things you'll never find. Stop if the car is going clunk. Don't fall for an amusing hunk, however rich, unless he's kind. Don't answer emails when you're drunk. In this respect, I'm like a monk. I need some rules to bear in mind. Stop if the car is going clunk. Don't answer emails when you're drunk. Uh, for whatever it's worth, would I bring this? Yeah, it is great, Kevin. Um, what, what it is is a, is a, is a uh, representation of a, a closed form poem. 
We've done sonnets. This is a uh, uh, now. And, and so this is the point to you as coaches that you should have your students recognize the Pantone, find some Pantones, uh, Villanelles, Terzarimas, different types of sonnets, uh, the ballad form. They present, and here's a full question. If it's a uh, part three, I'll ask what kind of poem is this? What's the poetic form? What's the closed poetic form? And I'll throw up Villanelle or I'll throw up Terzarima or I'll put Petrarchan sonnet. To be able to recognize that these three, six, nine, 12, 15, 19 lines, the last stanza with four lines, Rep repetition of rhyme, no, repetition of lines. Yeah, it's a great poem for a lot of reasons. Wendy Cope, a lot of onomatopoeia, no, a lot of uh, onomatopoeia, yeah, a lot of sound, auditory, 250. Most like an arch, this marriage, John, I used to know his, how to pronounce his name, is it Ciardi? Most like an arch, we start off with, a simile, and then we have a definition of that arch, an entrance which upholds and shores the stone crush of the air, the stone crush up the air like lace. Again, simile, stone crush. Metaphorically, I don't want to go kidding with this one, mass made idea, an idea held in place. So we're shipping out of this simile driven comparison into a metaphor, mass made idea, an idea held in place, a lock in time, inside half heaven unfolds. And uh, my wife is out of the room, so I can make the, the connection between the title and line five, excuse me, line four, half heaven and marriage. That kind of, um, I don't know, uh, certainly a little quippy. Most like an arch. Now, if we had lines uh, repeatingly, let me back up. If we have lines sequentially repeating opening words, most like an arch, following one another immediately, that would be anaphora or anaphora. But this is beginning each of the stanzas, the first two, so this is not anaphora, anaphora. Most like an arch, two weaknesses that lean into a strength. And immediately the metaphor starts to, at least in my case, I, I know one weakness in this arch I'm part of for 43 years, and that's me, but the strength together, the metaphor starting to work. Two fallings become firm, almost paradoxical. Two joined abeyances become a term naming the fact that teaches fact to mean. Getting thicker here. Not quite that rhetorical question suggesting that not unlike say one of Browning's dramatic monologues we have someone we're talking to not much less world as it is what strong and separate falters echoing among other places Lincoln in a house divided all I do at piling stone on stone apart from you is ruthless around nothing Till we kiss, I am no more than upright and unset. What's just occurred to emphasize the bridging that an arch is between two weaknesses, between two that need to, as he goes into the attraction or abeyances coming to be a term that the fact teaches to mean, till we kiss, I am no more. This is enjambment. We are moving from one stanza to the next, the sentence structure, the grammatical aspect of it. And I said syntax a while ago, I meant semantics, the meaning of the sentence, the line continues. So here we have with all this, all these black characters on a white page, all this space that needs to be bridged, needs to be arched. Till we kiss, I am no more. This enjambment reinforces it on the page itself. And no, and so not in an auditory, but in a very visual way. All poetry is both auditory and visual when it ends up on the page. I ask E.E. E. Cummings. I am no more than upright and unset. It is by falling in and in we make the all-bearing point for one another's sake and faultless failing raised by our own weight. 
And Catherine, I think this is even a better point. Questions, David? None in the box. Uh, I'll remind as we've just had four stanzas uh, that are A, B, B, A. This, these are envelope stanzas, a term that is not in the 12th edition of the book. Actually, it is, but it's not alphabetized. It's in the discussion somewhere else in the book. Arms and the Man, Wilfred Owen's Arms and the Man, excuse me, Arms and the Boy. Arms and the Boy. Arms and the Man is the English translation of Virgil's opening line in Aeneid, the Aeneid. So here we have immediately, it's okay, Pop, go somewhere else. Immediately we have an illusion that um, Owen expects his educated audience there in the beginning of the 20th century to recognize. Let the boy try along this bayonet blade how cold steel is and keen with hunger of blood, blue with all malice like a madman's flash and thinly drawn with famishing for flesh. Uh, I, I don't doubt most of you have taught this. Uh, it remains one of my favorite and for many reasons and cuts deep, no pun intended. Let the boy try, an old use of the word uh, let, let him feel along this bayonet blade how cold steel is. And the, the immediate contrast is with the boy who is warm and keen with hunger of blood. And we're personifying here the blade. And we're rhyming blade and blood. This is a form of rhyme. It's a slant rhyme. This is rhyming the consonants and not the vowels. This is consonants. And what a lot of the World War I poets picked up on was they could take the old tradition, traditional forms and they could mess with it a bit. And so we don't have true rhyme. The world is at war. Things are out of kilter, so the rhyme is out of kilter. Lend him to stroke these, lend him, give him leave, give him permission. Lend him to stroke these blind, blunt bullet heads, bullet leads, excuse me, which long to nuzzle in the hearts of lads. Um, I don't need to talk about the imagery. I think it's incredibly uh, intense in its uh, contrast between the killing and the loving, not unlike what Kipling had done with death and love. Or give him cartridges of fine zinc teeth, sharp with the sharpness of grief and death. Sharp and sharpness. These are two words built on the same word, and this is polypotent. Its sister uh, trope is plosi, polypton, P-O-L-Y-P-T-O-T-O-N. I think I got that right. And plosi, P-L-O-C-E. Plosi is using the same word in the same line or close to the same line, using that same word differently. Uh, William Blake, if I remember in his, his poem, London, mark the marks. Look at the scratches, look at the blemishes, mark the marks. And here we have sharp and sharpness. This is Philippotin. For his teeth seem for laughing round an apple. Now, that seems pretty innocent until you recognize the image of a roasting pig, something that I think our friend um, Jonathan Swift does in Modest Proposal. There lurk no claws behind his fingers, supple. A little bit of inversion there. God did not make him with teeth to kill. They're for laughing and eating apples. He did not give him claws. And God will grow no talons at his heels, nor antlers to the thickness. And here we have poetic license, I think, uh, at least in terms of connotation, the curls, the youthful, uh, and for Wilfred Owen, no apologies being made the auto, excuse me, excuse me, the homoeroticism wherein the beautiful young boys are being sent off uh, for slaughter. What works here sets us up for the, the last poem in the packet, uh, the, the rhyming of blade with blood, the rhyming of flash with flesh, uh, with leads and lads, teeth and death, apples, supple, heels, curls, 
a type of rhyme that, that it's a tip of a hat to the tradition, but there's something that needs to be echoed in the beauty, beauty of linguistic expression, the poetry, when it addresses the, the death of the youth in a war that is all with malice and hunger of blood, to borrow Owen's terms. Any questions, David, popping up? No, just a request from Catherine that you make sure you have a question on the test about envelope stanzas now that we know what they are. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, all. Okay. Yeah. All right. Don't forget stigmatism. The rural carrier stops to kill a nine foot cotton mouth. One of my favorite sonnets. Uh, done this several times, and I don't think it offends anybody. Lord God, I saw the son of a bitch uncoil in the road ahead of me, uncoil and squirm for the ditch, squirm a hell of a long time, missed him with the car. When I got back to him, he was all but gone, nothing left on the road but the tip end of his tail and that disappearing into the Johnson grass. I leaned over the ditch and saw him balled up now, this I aimed for the mouth and shot him. And shot him again. Then, I got a good strong stick and dragged him out. He was long and evil, thick as the top of my arm. There are things in this world a man can't look at without wanting to kill. Don't ask me why. I was calm enough, I thought, but I felt my spine squirm suddenly. I admit it. It was mine. Okay, okay. I can only imagine all of us like the poem. Um, Nine foot cotton mouth, I, I think that's hyperbole. They stay around four foot, maybe. But maybe the fangs are extra long. Uh, but uh, what I want to draw your attention to is the difference between the octave and the sestet. I want to point to, in this case, Hummer has decided to put white space between the octave and the sestet of this sonnet. And he starts the sestet with a temporal turn. This is a, a volta, V-O-L-T-A, that which we find in Italian sonnets most often. When it's an Italian sonnet without a turn, it's a Miltonic sonnet, though Milton did write sonnets in Italian. And uh, which isn't to say there won't be found a volta in a, any other kind of sonnet, including the Shakespearean sonnet. But it's either temporal or logical. Here we have a temporal. Then the first Stanza, the octave, has that unrhyming rhyme. Coil rhymes with all. Oh my gosh, it's an envelope stanza there, Captain. Squirm and time rhyme. End and again rhyme. Grass and hiss rhyme. That is, if you're scared to death when you're looking at a cottonmouth. Then, after the cottonmouth is dead, what do we have? We have traditional working rhyme, out, without, arm, calm, spine, mind. The Volta echoes that things are better in the world after the killing of the cotton Which is the point to the poet's, not only his use of words to great advantage, and form to great advantage, but taking that form as Owen did with his uh, arms and the boy and using the expectation of rhyme scheme and coming with a slant rhyme, this consonants, which has the consonants rhyming, but not the vowels to point to a bit of, of uh, this, this unnerving point he missed him with the car, he's got to get out and shoot him and shoot him again. Uh, a little bit different here, the uncivilized to the civilized. If you look at that as a threshold. Speaking of threshold, our word is, uh, Maddie will remember for threshold, uh, liminality. That might show up, Catherine, liminality. When we come, uh, we look at Thomas Hardy's Darkling Thrush, the liminality of going from one century to the next century, uh, going from uh, night to day, from, so that sort of thing. 
So that's what I have here in the short hour that we had, and we've ended it in 60 minutes, but I think David will let us go if you have some questions. Um, this is what I've pointed out in each of these poems is representative of what I look for in a poem to ask multiple choice questions. Most of those terms you'll find in that listing of terms, but also other terms that are close to the ones that I might uh, 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 be addressing in a particular poem or serving as a distractor when we work. So for instance, I have paradox, but I also have oxymoron. We didn't come across any oxymorons, but make certain that your lit critters understand the difference between an oxymoron and a paradox. And back to synecdoche and metonymy, while there is a difference, sometimes it's such a subtle difference, I'll never have them uh, as two of the options on a multiple, multiple choice test. So that's, that's what I have, David. Do we have any questions for Mark? Feel free to unmute yourself if you do. I don't see anything in the chat box. I've got one coach for the kiddo up at Princeton. I have one coach for the kiddo at Rice. Angie, how's he doing? He's doing great. He's in summer school right now. So he's okay. doing things. Hello for me. Will do. Your show, David. All right. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you very, very much for being with us through uh, this session and all the other uh, capital conference sessions that you've attended more than just the literary criticism. It's been a great summer. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. Mark, you have anything you want to wrap up with? Yeah, I want to talk about my, my, my memory. Uh, we have a, a coach there with a student at Rice, and we have a coach with a student at at Yale, not Princeton, that's down the road in high school uh, where someone taught, uh, but at Yale. Sorry about that, Gail. Sorry about that, Maddie. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mark. And we'll wrap, that'll wrap up our session for literary criticism today. Thanks for attending.